In this video, we introduced the link layer, or layer two of the network, including the services supported, and looking at the basics of error detection and correction, including cyclic redundancy checks. Let's get started. We've now reached the sixth chapter in Caruso and Ross, Computer Networking, a Top-Down Approach. As before, we're using the slides supplied by the authors to accompany the book. Now that we've reached the link layer, or layer two of the network stack, we're looking at details on a much smaller scale than we've been examining so far. Up to now, we've been trying to understand the details of how a packet proceeds from one device to the other side of the internet, maybe the other side of the world, or maybe to a server located in some distant place. But with a link layer, we're considering the details of how a message gets from one device to the very next device that it's plugged into, or maybe from a wireless device to the access point or the cell tower that it's directly connected to, so just one hop away. To do that, we'll first understand the principles behind link layer services, as we've done with each chapter throughout the course. These include things like detecting and correcting errors, and actually sharing access to a limited resource, whether that's RF spectrum or bandwidth on a wired connection. Then we'll get into the details of addressing at the link layer, which works very differently from IP addressing. And we'll look at the details of the most common local area network technologies, such as Ethernet and VLANs. These same link layer technologies are used in data centers, but the scale of data centers brings with it some specific constraints and challenges. And so we'll spend a little time looking at the specific considerations of those environments. And of course, along the way, we'll consider the implementation details of various link layer technologies. So in this video, we'll introduce the link layer and its services and look at some details of the error detection and correction mechanisms used at this layer. As we mentioned, the link layer is responsible for getting a message from one device to its directly connected neighbor. And it's going to do this over a link. That link may be a wire or that link may be an RF channel. Just to make sure we're all on the same page with terminology, all of the devices that we've seen so far, whether they're hosts or routers or whether we've called them an edge device or a core device, they're all just nodes at this layer. An individual link doesn't really care about what higher level role a particular device is playing in the greater internet architecture. Anything that connects two or more nodes together is a link. Some links are physically only capable of having two devices connected to them, while other links may have more than two devices. We typically divide links into the categories of wired, or wireless. We also divide link technologies down by whether they are used for LANs, local area networks, or WANs, wide area networks. At layer two, the specific name for our packet type is called a frame. So when IP sends out a datagram, it is encapsulated in a frame at the link layer. Where layer two really diverges from the layers we've looked at so far is that an individual message will traverse multiple diverse layer two link types as it proceeds through the network. So while it is IP end-to-end, -end, and whatever is above that, the UDP or transport protocol, exists end-to-end, -end, below IP, it may go from Wi-Fi to wired Ethernet, to a fiber backhaul link, to a cellular network, all as it traverses one path through the internet. Each link protocol may be very different in the services it provides. For example, wireless links typically provide reliability, while wired link protocols typically do not. If we want to think of this in terms of another transportation analogy, we can envision a human tourist embarking on a trip while they would take multiple modes of transportation, including a car service to get to the airport, commercial air travel from one country to another, and then a train to deliver them from the airport to their final destination. Each of these modes of transportation comes with its own protocols, and yet they're transporting the same tourist and baggage along the way. The link layer is responsible for managing access to the link resources i.e. the available bandwidth. And in doing so, they will apply the framing that's needed. The link layer also has its own addressing, which we call MAC addresses. MAC stands for Media Access Control. On links with low bit error rates, which typically include wired ethernet or fiber, even over long distances, there is little justification to induce the overhead that would be caused by running a reliability protocol. So on the rare occasion that a packet is lost to an error on one of these links, it is left to the higher layers to retransmit that packet. However, on wireless links, the bit error rates are much higher, so it is much more common that a frame would be lost on a wireless link. And so wireless links typically implement reliability. So the question being posed here is why include reliability at the link layer if it's already included at the transport layer? The answer is that there's a performance gain here. 
Thinking back to TCP, which handles our reliability end-to-end, -end, every time a packet is lost, TCP reduces its window by half, so it slows down its sending rate by half, and this is a significant performance hit because TCP assumes that every packet lost is a sign of congestion. If the actual reason for the packet loss is just corruption on the wireless link, that has nothing to do with congestion, so TCP cutting its window size by half accomplishes nothing but wastes a lot of bandwidth. So in light of this reality, the wireless link will retransmit the packet locally, which it can do very quickly because the round trip times on a connected wireless link are small fractions of a millisecond. Thus the end-to-end -end TCP connection will be unaware that its packet was ever lost and it will not take the associated performance hit. The link layer may also have to worry about flow control, depending on other factors of the link layer technology. It will likely have some form of error detection, even on highly reliable links, and depending on whether it's a reliable or unreliable link technology, it will either signal that a retransmission is needed or drop the frame that contains an error. These errors are also typically counted by the devices so the operators can check for excessive error rates. Error correction is an additional mechanism that is only applied on certain link types, which can repair a corrupted frame without having to ask for it to be retransmitted. This is more common on long delay links, such as satellite links. We can also distinguish link technologies by whether they are half-duplex or full-duplex. On full-duplex links, devices on both ends of the link can transmit at the same time and not interfere with one another. However, in a half-duplex link, only one device can transmit at a time and any others must be in a listening state. One could use the analogy of walkie-talkies or emergency radios as a half-duplex mechanism which can't receive and transmit both at the same time, unlike the wired telephone system, which is a full-duplex communication technology. Every host must have a link layer implementation in order to communicate, and the hosts on both ends of the link must be using the same link layer technology. The full implementation is in the network interface card, commonly referred to as a NIC, which may be a separate physical card, for example in a desktop computer or a large router, or it may just be a chip on the main board of a device such as a smartphone or a laptop. In either case, the NIC is able to handle the real-time requirements of the link layer without involving the host CPU every step of the way. The NIC will also have its own firmware, which is the software that's embedded onto the chip or the card that determines its operations. The NIC communicates with the CPU and memory of the system through the host system buses. As an aside, while the host system bus drawn in this picture is shown as a shared bus architecture, the system buses on all modern computers use a packet-switched architecture known as PCI Express. So we can see then that within the host, our network stack is actually divided into layers that are implemented on the network interface card and layers that are implemented by the operating system. In practice, the operating system needs to be aware of some aspects of the link layer operation. So the functions of that layer get split between the interface and the operating system. Looking at our flow of operations, we have a datagram ready for the IP layer to send and it gets passed onto the link layer where it's encapsulated in a frame. Later on, we'll see the details of some of those link layer headers. It's then sent out over the physical link to the next hop, which can read the associated headers, de-encapsulate the datagram, and pass that on up the network stack. Now let's look at those error detection and correction mechanisms a little bit more. In order to perform these mechanisms, we must send some redundant bits along with the original data. So we have our original data, and then added to that are our error detection and correction bits. When we looked at the UDP header and TCP header, we saw how this was done by adding bits called the internet checksum. And that was a very simplistic way of doing error detection. At the link layer, while the concept is the same, we add redundant bits to allow for correction. The actual mechanisms used are a bit more sophisticated. Once this passes through our link, whatever comes out the other side is D prime and EDC prime. These could be identical to D and EDC, but the receiver has no way of knowing that until it performs the error detection operation. If it passes the check, it can then pass the datagram on up the stack, or if not, it can drop the frame or signal the link layer to perform retransmission if that's the type of link layer it's being used on. It is important to understand that no error detection is 100% reliable. The more redundant bits that are used in the scheme, the better the reliability will be, but it can never be 100% and so the level of error detection used is based on a statistical measure of the probability of bit errors on the link. So the goal here is to reduce the probability that any error would get past the error detection to a very small number, but it can never completely eliminate the chance that errors will go undetected. A common form of error checking is known as parity checking. 
For example, with a given number of data bits, d, we can follow it with a parity bit that causes some mathematical relationship to be true. In this case, we are causing there to be an even number of ones when the data bits and parity bit are combined. So in this case, there were an odd number of ones in d, and so we added one more with the parity bit, so now there's just an even number of ones in total. If there were already an even number of ones in d, we would set the parity bit to zero. So far, this is still a very weak form of error checking. A better option is two-dimensional parity checking. In this case, we line up our binary data in a number of rows instead of just one row. Then we check every row and every column's parity, and we add one more parity bit in the corner, which checks the parity bits. So here's an example of a populated two-dimensional parity bit scheme with no errors. If this data and parity were transmitted through a link and one of the bits flipped, there would be a parity error on both the row and the column identifying exactly which bit flipped. Since there's only two possible states for the bit, it can be corrected by flipping it back and the data can be delivered to the IP layer. So we would say that the two-dimensional parity scheme can detect and correct any single bit error. If two bits were flipped, the scheme would also detect that an error had occurred, but it's not guaranteed to be able to correct a two-bit error. As we mentioned, we've seen the checksum before in the UDP header. It works by treating the entire UDP datagram as a sequence of 16-bit integers, adds them all up using the ones complement sum, and then stores the checksum, the inverse of the sum, in the UDP header. On the receiver side, we compute the checksum of the received segment and see if it matches the checksum field value. Now this scheme has no error correction. It can detect errors, but all it can do at that point is discard the segment. It has no way of telling which bit or bits were flipped along the way. As we also mentioned, this is a weak checksum and there's a certain combination of bit errors that could get past it. At the link layer, we use CRCs, cyclic redundancy checks, which are much more powerful than the internet checksum. So we have our data bits, but we also need a generator, which is a pattern of bits that is a known parameter of the system. So with d data bits and our bit pattern r, we can compute these as d times 2 to the r xored with capital R. And we're going to choose our CRC bits such that the tuple dr is exactly divisible by g using binary division. Like we said, g is a known parameter, meaning the sender and the receiver and all other devices using this CRC scheme know g ahead of time. The receiver then can perform the division, and if they get anything other than zero as the remainder, they know that an error has occurred along the way. This can detect R bits and error in the transmission. And this is the error detection scheme that is used in wired Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Let's compute an example. Remember, on the sender side, we need to find R such that when DR is divided by G, the remainder will be zero. Or when D is shifted left by R bits, lowercase r bits, and divided by g, we can take the remainder of that and use it as r. So here's our g, known ahead of time, and we need to divide that into d, but we're going to left shift d by r bits, and so there's our d times 2 to the r. Now we're set up for our division. We can see that g divides into the first four bits one time, we have a remainder, and we can proceed with our binary long division, bring additional bits down until we can divide g into it, and so at this point, We've completed dividing our D that's been left shifted by G, and we're left with the remainder at the bottom, which is 0, 1, 1. That remainder becomes our capital R that will be sent with the data across the network. That wraps up our overview of error detection and correction. In the next video, we'll start looking at MAC protocols, which stands for Media Access Protocols. See you then! We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.